So everyone, I want to welcome you all to the Level Up series. My name is Heather Stoven and my pronouns are she and her. I'm the Extension Horticulturist in Yamhill County, Oregon. Yamhill County is located within the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1850, 1855, the Kalapuya were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, the living descendants are a part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated, Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. Thank you for coming today to this Growing Oregon Gardeners Level Up session. This series is produced by the Oregon State University Extension Master Gardener Program and has been organized and led by a group of Master Gardener coordinators, OSU faculty and staff from across the state. The OSU Extension Master Gardener Program educates Oregonians about the art and science of growing and caring for plants. We're in 27 counties across the state and train thousands of Master Gardener volunteers. OXU Extension Master Gardeners are volunteer educators, neighbors, and on-the-ground researchers who serve their community with solid training in science-based, sustainable gardening and the love of learning. If you're a Master Gardener volunteer, thank you for dedicating your time and knowledge. If you're not a Master Gardener but are interested in becoming one, in Oregon we'll be hosting training for new volunteers in 2022. You can learn more about the program and about other workshops in the series on our website. Today's workshop is being recorded and will be accessible to view along with all the presentations in the series on the website. So some general housekeeping about how to use the tools in Zoom. So all of our participants are muted and um, therefore we have the Q&A box, which for um, many programs is located at the bottom of your screen. Um, so please type your questions in there and then we will um, do our best to answer them as the presentation is going on or we will save them for our presenter Lane at the end. So after the presentation, you'll be sent a, an evaluation via email for our webinar. So please fill this out so we will know how we did today, and this will help us continually make improvements to the series. So today our talk is going to be unique winter vegetables to grow, and our presenter is Lane Selman. So I'm gonna um, introduce her and lead, read her bio, and then she will start. So Lane is a professor of practice at Oregon State University and the founder of the Culinary Breeding Network. She has worked with organic farmers, plant breeders, and chefs for over 15 years. Lane's work has been featured in the media, including Food and Wine, The Wall Street Journal, Civil Eats, Food Tank, The New York Times, and Eating Well Magazine. Lane has been the recipient of many awards, including the Award of Excellence for an Organic Advocate by Oregon Organic Coalition in 2016. Lane grew up in a citrus farm in her Sicilian great-grandparents planted in 1919 in Florida's Space Coast. She has a bachelor's in agronomy and a master's in entomology, both from the University of Florida. In 2000, she moved to Oregon and since 2005 has been managing collaborative research projects and outreach events at OSU with organic vegetable and grain farmers. In 2012, she created the Culinary Breeding Network to build communities of plant breeders, seed growers, farmers, produce buyers, chefs, and other stakeholders to improve quality in vegetables and grains. She currently serves in the Portland Farmers Market and the Portland Bologna Sister City Association Boards, and she lives in uh, Portland, Oregon. So um, at any rate, I want to welcome Lane and thank her for coming. And we're looking forward to hearing all about winter vegetables. So welcome, Lane. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Um, as Heather said, I'm going to talk to you about unique winter vegetables to grow. Um, I forgot those two words at the end of the title, to grow. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and start. Um, and just a little bit of uh, background what the Culinary Breeding Network is. Uh, Heather already um, talked about it in the intro, but it is this initiative to build communities of plant breeders, seed growers, um, farmers, produce buyers, chefs, and other stakeholders, including gardeners and just general eaters, um, to improve quality in vegetables and grains. Um, so just bringing together a lot of oftentimes disconnected individuals to have a say in how, how, what varieties turn out to be once they are released, once the plant breeder is working on them for potentially a decade or more. Um, making sure that they come out and are released into the world and they are what gardeners want and what chefs want and what commercial farmers want. 
And the way that the Culinary Reunion Network works oftentimes is it works with large um, university research projects um, and identifies relationships and finds those stakeholders that we should be engaging with in that project, building community within research projects and creating engagement through interactive uh, public outreach events, activities um, that I'm gonna sh share a little bit about with you, ones that we've done in the past because as COVID is kind of, um, you know, lessening up, hopefully we get to have a lot of these public events again in the future. So I want to invite you to them. So these are some of the projects that I um, am currently um, working on in the Wheat Winter Vegetables project just ended just um, at the end of March. And that's the one I'm going to focus on today. But I do work on a couple of different grains projects where um, there are plant breeders all over the country that are breeding specifically um, for organic systems. And as well as Novik is also a national project that is breeding vegetable varieties. Um, and then we have a, a radicchio focused project. And since that is a winter vegetable, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. And then the Eat Winter Vegetables um, project that has nine different vegetables in it. Um, and one of the reasons is that we selected winter vegetables is, you know, for those of you that are tuning in that are in Oregon, which I think is a lot of you, Oregon and Washington has, a, and on the West side, um, definitely, they, we can be growing all year round. Um, and we have a really thriving like farmer's market culture. We have a lot of individuals here that go to the market, get really excited um, about going. It's also like a social event. There's so many vegetables and foods to choose from. Um, people are really excited to eat locally. Um, and then it starts raining. And then even for folks that are in a CSA, maybe they don't do the year round CSA because these vegetables in the winter time are a little more challenging as far as flavor and excitement and um, what to do with them. A lot of people don't know how to cook with them. Um, but, you know, my job is to kind of try to get people more excited about those things. Um, and we have seen a lot more demand for winter vegetables in the last you know, five to 10 years. This is John Navazio, who used to be a plant breeder at Organic Seed Alliance in Washington, but now he's at Johnny Seeds in Maine. Um, and he, there's a quote here that says that winter vegetables are the fastest growing green segment. The market for those crops, especially radicchio, spinach, chicory, purple sprouted broccoli is expanding faster than any of them can keep up with. So this is on the seed side. So that we're seeing that as far as farmers and gardeners, um, people are more and more interested in growing them. So that's really fantastic. So that must mean that people are more excited about eating them, we hope. Um, so this is our focus on this one particular project. Um, this is a this was a specialty crops block program grant, and that is um, that is given to uh, that was given to us at OSU by Oregon Department of Agriculture, um, and as a part of a large um, USDA program. The vegetables that we what we we focused on for the two and a half years that this project was going are winter squash garlic, celeriac, cabbage, cauliflower, radicchio, Brussels sprouts, purple sprouted broccoli, and we actually added one the second year, which was collards, and I'll explain to you why in just a little bit. Um, and we had a lot of outreach activities with that. We grew demonstration trials to have a lot of different variety of those out in the field that gardeners and farmers could come to at our um, our NRAC, the Northern, the North Willamette Station in Canby, Oregon, so that we could have people out there and walk around and take a look at them, talk to the seed companies and the plant breeders that offer them. Um, and then we have these Sagra events, variety showcase, and I'm sorry, I can't see my screen right here. Okay. And then we have an Eat Winter Vegetables website that I'm going to tell you about. That's a really great resource for growing as well cook as cooking. So some of the public outreach events that we did in this project. Um, so one that we did was called a Sagra. And a Sagra is a festival to celebrate something that is either grown or enjoyed, eaten in a local area. It's inspired by festivals that happen in Italy, in small villages, as well as bigger cities. And it focuses on something that they grow in that area or a very specific culturally important dish. And so at this event, we had 
um, it was a farmer's market. We work with the Friends and Family Farmers. It was a market where farmers were selling the veggies, but then we had also these, what I kind of call um, endearingly uh, vegetable cheerleaders around the edge. And this was kind of the party or the sagra part of this um, that made it more of like an event than just a market where we had different culinary educators and advocates and chefs showing people how to take these vegetables that they might not appreciate as much as possibly they could um, and that they could be buying in the winter time to uh, eat locally and support local farmers. So here's Catherine Dooming, Doomling on the left. She has a business called Cook With What You Have, and she has fantastic recipes that are very approachable, very easy to use for home cooks. She's focused on cabbage. On the right-hand side, we have Jim Dixon, who is a culinary advocate, really wants people to get in there and start cooking for themselves with celeriac. And in the middle, we have a, um, a professional chef, Tim Wastel, who works on many of our projects with us. And he's showing people how to safely and properly cut into winter squash, because one of the reasons that we have found out that people aren't eating very much winter squash, there's numerous reasons, but one of the reasons is they're afraid to cut it. And so to, to try to empower people to feel good about like, I can actually take the celeriac and make it into something that tastes really fantastic and I can prepare it safely. So this is a gathering where people would have, um, they would have a lot of uh, kids with them um, that would be excited to taste things and try things. Like I said, this is before COVID, but hopefully we do this again in the future. Um, and they can taste the, the celeriac soup and they're like, oh, I really like this mom, dad, like, can you get some of this? And then they can buy it and um, hopefully eat it for the rest of the winter time and into the future. So that's what we're trying to do at this, this event. We give them a lot of information. We have a lot of info here, Sredikio and garlic to get people more knowledgeable about it because I think that the more knowledgeable people are about the different vegetables, the more likely they are to be excited about eating them. And so that went, went along with this, um, uh, this project, like I mentioned, was a website. So there's a website, um, eatwintervegetables.com, and all of those recipes that were prepared at the event um, can be found online. So that we're giving out the recipes there. So if you tried them, uh, you can just take it home and make it that evening if you wanted, but they're also here for you if you lose the recipe, if you weren't at the, at the event. These are all very easy to make at home recipes. So it's a really great resource. So if you're growing these things in the garden and you're buying them at the market or at the grocery store, I encourage you to take a look at them. The event was pretty big. We had like a thousand people. There was a lot of impact for farmers. So there's about 30 farmers that came to this. Again, we had a thousand people. There was a lot of, um, there's $87,000 worth of local veggies and um, meats that were, were sold there. We, um, there was $1,300 in SNAP dollars used. And again, this was an ODA um, grant and it was supported also by the East Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation, Bejo Seeds and EcoTrust. I see someone's raising their hand. Can I, is there something I can answer right now? Just let me know. If not, I'll answer them at the end. And I was gonna say, I think for individuals, rather than raising your hand, if you could just type your questions into the Q&A box and then at the end, we'll, we'll get to the questions, we'll ask Elaine. Great, thank you. Another event that um, we've done that focuses on winter veggies is uh, the Sagra del Radicchio. Uh, and this is something that's happened in Seattle, Washington. And I'm happy to say that we are planning on doing that in Portland, Oregon in October. I'm going to give you the date at the end of this. Um, and we're um, really excited to, at the opportunity to, to do this one again. It's going to focus on Radicchio. So if you like radicchio and even if you don't i suggest that you come to it i it, it's uh it's we're finding it a really fantastic crop to grow here it does really well in the cool um weather that we have in the winter time it overwinters really well too so i know gardeners are very excited about what we can have in our gardens all during the winter time and then have something to eat um you know in january february march um, so I'll give you a little more resources about that in the end, but this is a really cool um, event to talk about all the different types of uh, radicchio that you could be growing uh, and eating. Okay, so this past year you know, um, was really kind of an opportunity, even though we did have COVID, we couldn't do these in-person events, we decided to transition them to online. And so I started a, a YouTube channel 
uh, and we did everything online. So um, we had something called Rad TV. So the Sagra del Radicchio became an entire day long of content and not just people that were physically in the area that could come. We actually had people all over the world tune in as well as Ital this is Italian crop, the Radicchio. So we had Italians that grow seed and do breeding and farm there to be able to present and talk to us about this traditionally um, uh, Italian crop. Um, they figured out a lot more than we have here because they've been growing and it's been more, it's been important in their country for longer. Um, so there are weeks that we did for this, for the Sagra, we had entire week long of winter squash and brassicas and um, garlic and so on. And I do encourage you to go in here and take a look because we had 83 presentations that were done. Um, each is about an hour long and they were, they're, they're such a fabulous resource. Uh, so if you're interested in garlic and want to know like what variety to, um, you know, to grow, what's the difference in uh, hard neck and soft neck, breeding, where it's from in the world, folklore, everything you can think of. <laughs> we had people talking about during garlic week. So, so check it out this. Um, this is, I, had, I give you the address at the end, but it's the YouTube site for Culinary Breeding Network. Okay, so some resources for you. Um, I told you about Eat Winter Vegetables. We also had a, um, another gr um, grant before this that was all about winter squash. So trying to get people excited about different types of winter squash, because one thing you may have noticed as a gardener, but definitely farmers have noticed is when you're growing a lot of winter squash and then you're putting it into storage, which is, you know, it's called winter squash for a reason. We put it into storage, the carbohydrates, you know, uh, turn into sugars. Uh, and they ripen at different times and they are things that we eat in the winter time. And so the, a lot of the, the squash that are on the market rot pretty quickly, um, especially the ones that are the most popular, it seems with consumers like delicata and butternut. We heard a lot of complaints from farmers that they were rotting in storage, but there are other types that store really well. So we wanted to find those ones that grew really well for gardeners and organic farmers and the ones that taste great and store for a long time. So again, we wanted everything, right? So this, if you go to this website, there's a lot of really great information on there. It talks about all the different types, how long they store, what they're best used for in the kitchen, um, some recipes, but there's, and there's uh, information about growing squash and some links to go back to our Oregon Vegetables OSU website where you can get a lot more information about growing. And so back to eat winter vegetables, there's a lot of, I didn't, I, I just took some screenshots here, but if you go in there, you can just scroll through and find a lot of information. Like I said, there's the nine vegetables. So for each one, we give a little bit of a, um, a, a blurb about what it is, um, how to select when you're, when you're at a store, how to select for it once you harvested it or bought it, how you store it, how do you prep it? and then some nutritional facts. And then for every one of them we go through, and this is just one little screenshot, I think we had about 18 different types of gar garlic varieties um, that we grew in our trials. So you can go through and take a look at all the different varieties with some nice photos, but then you click these photos and it goes to the um, descri further descriptions of the particular variety and then where you can buy the seed. So I wanna tell you a little bit about the, the, the highlights because that's what you guys want, right? As growers uh, or gardeners, you wanna know which ones perform the best. So for each of these crops, we work with the farmers to have them tell us which one, which varieties they wanted included in the trials. Uh, and the trials were grown out at the, North, the OSU um, farm called the North Willamette Research and Education Center down in Canby. We um, grew out multiple reps of each one and they were just for observation. We didn't collect a lot of data on these because it was more for uh, just general observation. And these are the ones that kind of stood out quite a bit. These are the ones that grew very well, that stored well, and that tasted good too. So Tetsu Kuboto is the one that um, has really stood out for us. And I wanna say that Farmers in this area in Oregon and in Washington have added this to 
um, that have added this to their, you know, their squash portfolio, if that's what you want to call it. Uh, so their squash offerings and what they grow in, um, you know, for market, for CSA, it's, it actually translates in Japanese to steel helmet. And it really is quite sturdy. It has a hard rind, uh, which, you know, you have to be careful about, um, uh, <laughs> cutting into it, but don't worry. If you go to the Eat Winter Squash website, you can watch the videos of Tim showing how to properly cut into your winter squash. Um, but it's just so for that reason, it really stores quite well and it tastes great. I mean, I have some right now that is still storing and it's what June. So, um, and I can cut into it and it's going to taste great, I'm sure. Um, and so that's the one that's here on the bottom right hand side. Black Futsu is another that's done very well. Um, you might have seen this in, um, I'm seeing it now more and more mainstream grocery stores. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of it here, but if you Google it, it kind of has a little bumps all over it and it starts out green when it's harvested and then it turns a, a shade of orange. So that's really nice because then you actually can see when it's ready to eat because it is kind of a guessing game sometimes like, is this squash going to taste good or not? Is it, is it fully um, ripened yet? So that's one that we really like. It's available in a lot of different places now because it has gotten quite popular. One thing about the black futsu that's really cool is um, it tastes great raw. So that was one other thing that we found out from consumers that they had um, that made them a little more apprehensive about winter, uh, cooking with winter squash is um, well, they didn't really have very many recipes. A lot of times you start, you see these recipes that start off saying cut it in half open it up, put it in a 350 degree oven and just like basically let it go into like, you know, baby food. <laughs> and then, you know, there's only so much you can do with that. You could, you could mix it with some brown sugar and cinnamon or something and eat it like that. Or you can like put it into muffins and, and things and, you know, that type of thing. But what are the other things that you can be doing with it? And we found that get, like, it also takes a long time to cook it. Right. But, um, Black Futsu and several of the others actually taste really great. If you just take one of those vegetable peelers that instead of being kind of vertical, it's more horizontal. That's the easiest one to use. And then make these ribbons, or if you have one of those crazy spiral things, you can do the spiral thing and make your um, zoonals or whatever they call them, right? And you can, you can eat it that way. And it's really fantastic. And there are recipes that are on that Eat Winter Squash website that are specifically for the ones that taste good raw. So the, 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 the squash are actually in these different types. We call them salad squash, the ones that taste good raw. And all the salad squash ones that we trialed and thought that were, and our chef that we were working with thought they tasted good that way. We put them in that category. And then there's recipes and you can use them interchangeably for whichever one you happen to have on hand. But he has a really great radicchio and um, black futsu salad that's really spectacular. Um, so we had Katie's sweet meat as well, which is also another open pollinated. So this, as you can see, it's a mixture. We had OPs and hybrids in our trial. So Katie's sweet meat is a really great one. And then sunshine. Um, Johnny's has a um, plant, uh, a, a squash breeder on, um, on their team that does all their squash breeding. Her name is Lindsay. This is sunshine at the top. And she's doing a lot of really fantastic work. And they've, they've really been focused quite a bit on winter squash um, breeding up there because winter squash is quite popular in Maine and the Northeast. And so sunshine is one of theirs and it's a really fantastic one. And so we found that um, most of the time when I'm talking about transplants, they are uh, four weeks old. And so they were transplanted in early June um, to get the yields that, and, you know, that was just how we dealt with it in our, um, in our trials, but you could still be, you could still be planting when, um, winter squash right now, the transplants. And so, um, if you go to that website, when you click on, let's say black Futsu, then you'll get more information like this, right? So it gives you a little bit of a, a description, um, and then when to find it and when you can eat it. So, there's a little more information about each one on the website. Okay, so cabbage. Um, we Most of the cabbages that we looked at because we were looking for winter production and, and overwintering varieties were savoy types. There were green ones and there are purple. 
Dead On was one that did very well. Dead On and January King seem to be very good um, varieties and all the different trials and all the different projects. So I've worked on cabbage, which seems like it's been a lot. Um, so January Keen is our OP that was a standout and that's a quite a beautiful cabbage as well. Um, Maribel, which is a hybrid from Tozer, Ruby Perfection from Johnny's um, and Wairosa from Fedco. And these are transplanted in late July. And um, one thing that we did on our website is, and you can take a look, the same kind of um, description here about it. These are actually photos that are from the field. So you can see them growing at the, the, the NRAC um, uh, farm. You see these little carrots on the side. So that actually is a scrolling thing. So there's, you can scroll back and forth and see them at different times of the the season, there's also some videos sometimes where they're being harvested. You can take a look at a lot of resources in there. And then also we worked with that same chef, Tim Wastel, who we gave him the top performing varieties of each of these. Um, I think the top three of each of the vegetables we gave to him to write some culinary descriptions. So these are, this is an example of one of his descriptions where he talks a little bit about um, just kind of the appearance of it and his initial reaction to how he would use it. Um, and then as well as then how, what he would actually do with it. So in this one, I'm gonna have to move this a second, but he's talking about, um, you know, doing it on a grill, you know, just because it says on the grill, I mean, you could also do that, you know, roast that in your oven, right? But he's like really liking it um, charred and cooked rather than, than raw, although he does, and he talks about it raw here. So he kind of, goes through and evaluates the, the variety from the culinary aspect and tells us what he thinks about each of those three um, for cabbage. Okay, so radicchio. Radicchio is a, is a big favorite of mine. Like I said, we've got an entire project that all focuses on radicchio because it is something that can be grown really well here. And it's a crop that needs some more marketing around it because it is promising for farmers to grow here, but it's just really not known that well. Um, and a lot of people aren't the biggest fan of it because as I talked about those challenging winter flavors, well, bitter is <laughs> definitely what we think about when we think about radicchio. Um, there are definite ways to curb that. You can cut it up and once you get into the kitchen, you cut it up and you soak it in ice water for about an hour and then you know, toss that water and spin it and clean it and it really tones it down. Um, pairing it with something that's kind of creamy or another strong flavor like anchovy, if you like that, but you can do like, you can make um, uh, like a creamy dressing or even one that is with not, not dairy, but like with nuts, something like that, like heavier, stronger flavors actually go really well with radicchio if you want to eat it raw, but to even further like tone it, tone down the bitterness is cooking it. So that can mean sauteing it or roasting it. Sometimes it's pickled. You can do a lot of things to it to, if you're not so much of a fan of the bitterness to take that sharp edge off. Um, but there is a lot of confusion about radicchio. One reason is, this is one of the reasons why we made this poster. So it talks about the different, these are different types. Um, so there's Vergato di Caso Franco, there's Rosso di Chioggia. That's the one that you see most often, the round one, like when you go into a, a you know, a, um, a grocery store. Uh, if you're going to see radicchio at all, you're going to see that one. That's the most popular one. And all these mean, they mostly just translate like the Rosa di Chioggia means red from and Chioggia is a place. The one next to it is Veragato di Luzia. That one is just like variegated of Luzia, which is another place. Um, so all of these are different types, uh, like this one that says Costa Rosa in the single, you know, the single quotes are indicate the variety name. So that is actually a Rosso di Verona. So the red of Verona, but it has an actual um, variety name before it. So there are a lot of types. And then if you look on the left-hand side, that Rosso di Treviso Tardivo, that kind of looks kind of twisted, um, cobra kind of shape. Well, that one is, um, is, a, is a special needs <laughs> radicchio. That is like that one is grown out in the field for a while. It's uprooted. 
It's taken into uh, in a greenhouse and put into standing water, uh, protected from light, and then it starts to regrow and it regrows in this way. Um, so that one is maybe for like the more um, advanced radicchio grower. Um, tomorrow, actually, there'll be a New York Times article that Margaret Roach has written, and you guys might know her. She is um, A Way to Garden is the name of her podcast and blog. And she is writing a piece about radicchio and talking about all the different types and trying to kind of demystify this confusion around radicchio. Um, but we did not do any of the forcing types in, in our trials. And we did not do this green one in the middle that says Puntarelle uh, di Galantina. That is another that is a little more challenging to grow. You can see these kind of like little buds. They are hollow stems that are forming and they're going to continue to grow taller um, if you let it keep going, but the, they are harvested at this size, very small, and they're these hollow stems that you push through this mesh and then soak in cold water. And um, it makes these, you should look, at, look it up after this. I could have put a picture of this on here, but the Puntarelle salad of Rome is very, um, a very popular dish there. And it's just served as a salad, but when you put it in the cold water and there are these little like shreds, uh, little strips of green, they curl up and they make a nice crunchy, like refreshing salad. Um, so that one is, is a little bit more tricky to grow, but these other ones really aren't. And um, I encourage you as gardeners to, to grow these. These are the ones that um, did the best for us in our trials. They are a mixture of these different types um, Osborne Seeds is a company that has the best seed quality for um, radicchio as well as uprising seeds. They are all getting their seed directly from Italy because they've just done a lot more work around the breeding and maintaining. Um, so they're further along with, than us. So that's what we've been mostly working with and found to be um, the most consistent um, and uniform. When we've been working in the past with like seeds from Italy, they're really fantastic. And they're really, you know, they're, they're good for us as gardeners, but commercial farmers aren't usually very happy with them because there's a lot of variability. So these are more uniform uh, varieties. And so we're seeding them mid-June. A lot of people use the solstice as the date that they would be seeding them and then transplanting them four weeks later. But that being said, like uprising seeds that is up in Bellingham, Washington, they seed them until mid-July and then transplant after that. And this is a project that I started actually with uprising seeds in Washington and Smarties, which is a uh, breeder in the, um, in the Northeast part of Italy where Radicchio is from. Um, and these are all the different, um, they are now, Uprising Seeds is now selling their seed in this Gusto Italiano project. And I'm just helping them by, um, oh, sorry, there's all these lines under them because I took a screenshot of a Word document. <laughs> um, but anyway, these are all the different types and all the different varieties that they have offered. And we had farmers trial them last year and um, they did really well. They were quite uniform um, and the farmers are all growing them again this year. So that might be a good, they sell, and that's the, the nice thing is they sell gardener size packets. So you don't have to buy large um, farmer size packets of these. So there's all the different um, chicories, which also includes an escarole. And at the bottom here, there's these Italian brassicas that are very specific to the Northeast part of Italy. Um, different than things that we have here in that the Fialaro is a brassica, a lot like Spigarello, if you've ever grown that, which is sort of like a leaf broccoli of sorts. Um, it's really nice, very tender, very sweet. Uh, so it also is for uh, winter production. There's a cabbage that looks a lot like a January King and then a couple of different cauliflower, which are smaller cauliflower. But the nice thing about this is they've been bred to be the smaller headed cauliflower, but they have like the leaves really tightly wrap around the head and the leaves are very edible. So you can just cut them in half, 
uh, our quarters and roast them. And they're really spectacular with all the leaves attached and everything. So something fun. I don't know if those, um, the cauliflower would be very profitable for a farmer to grow. Although I do know some farmers that have been growing them this past year. Um, but definitely for gardeners, I think this would be really fun. And so the um, Bono Rivo is uh, the early and the Tardivo is late. So, and that early is like 120 days and the late is 200 days. So even the early is kind of late. <laughs> so um, I, I encourage you to take a look at these if you want. You, you can find all this on Uprising Seed sell these, Sells These Seeds. Okay, so we did a Brussels sprout trial and we found we had a lot of problems with aphids, which most of you guys are probably, you know, well aware of. Um, but um, we tried a lot of different Brussels sprouts and we found the red darling um, and Nautic. Nautic is a green, but we found that red darling and Nautic were the best ones. And interestingly, since red darling is red, it was the only red one that I know of. It's the only one that was in our trial. All the others were green. Um, and like, and these are like a huge favorite of like consumers and, and chefs alike. They get really excited about the color um, and they're, they're really striking and really tasty. So th these were transplanted. Um, we had a whole month that we, we did a couple of different plantings. So from June 15th to July 15th. Celeriac. I took a lot of pictures of different varieties of celeriac, but they all kind of look the same. <laughs> So we had, I think about, I think we had eight different varieties of celeriac. Um, the two that we found that did the best are these two, Bellina, which is a hybrid, and Brilliant, which is an OP. Um, we did find that some of them were quite sensitive to boron deficiency because we had like the hollow um, uh, root when it happened quite a bit, about, like the hollow stem in the inside. So um, these were transplanted in late May, early June. If you've ever grown celeriac, I had never grown celeriac and I had never, and you had knew nothing about this, but it's seeded in like February and they're not even harvesting it until like October. It's just the longest growing thing ever. Um, I just don't think that people uh, appreciate that as, as, as long as we have to grow this to get this. Um, but this is something that I think that as far as consumers are concerned, um, I think it's the thing that's the most surprising to them. Like they were never like, oh, look at this crazy looking <laughs> alien thing. I want to buy it. They don't. But then when they taste it, they get really excited about the flavor of it. Um, and, and we got a lot of people excited about it and turned on to it at like the Sagra. It's really important to get people to taste things because it really changes their perspective and attitude. Okay, garlic was something that we had in our trials. Um, I want to bring out the attention that we did write this, uh, I call it a zine, but it's a publication as a little booklet that is called Garlic Types and Market Niches. It was written by Alex Stone um, and Avram Drucker, who is a, he is a true seed garlic breeder and he has a company called Garlic Hanna. And if you like garlic, I really, really suggest that you take a look at his website. He has garlic from all over the world. He gets a lot of uh, seed from um, accessions from the Grin um, program, USDA program and grows them out and does true seed breeding and propagates a lot of garlic. And so he has a really fantastic, I have five of his garlics actually out in the in the, my garden right now. And we did a tasting last year. I did a tasting with a couple of chefs with like 18 different varieties of garlic all at once, uh, which was really interesting. But um, this zine, if you go to the culinarybreedingnetwork.com website, and I think also it is on the Eat Winter Vegetables website, um, you can find it there. It's just a, a PDF that you can just download or print out or whatever. So it's got some really fantastic information there um, about different garlic types. So we planted these in late October, November, and you know, for harvest at the end of June, beginning of July. But Garlic Hanna is a fantastic resource for all your garlic. So I mentioned at the beginning that we added collars to this project. And we did that because there was a Seed Savers Exchange was organizing a really big collar um, project called the Heirloom Collar Project. And were, they had 22 
varieties and the sessions and save seed that were from different individuals, mostly from the South that were in their collection that they wanted to grow out. And they got 200 participants all over the country to grow out at least a handful of these, um, at least I think six to eight um, per garden to grow them out and give them feedback. And we at NRAC, we did the full trial and the ones that, that stood out um, the best for us were Tabitha Dykes, the Georgia Southern Vates and Champion. Um, and it was really fantastic because there was growers in the, a few in the Pacific Northwest, not a lot, a lot in the South and a lot also in the um, Midwest, but there were some, they were, they were all over the country. It was really cool. Um, and we transplanted those in late July, early August. And some were, um, some were more winter hardy than others. So some were harvested earlier than others. But they have an entire website. I think that um, if you're interested in collards or brassicas at all, I suggest that you take a look at that um, and just read what they have to say about the project and all the different collards. And there, during the vegetable sagra that we did, that's on YouTube, we had an entire collards week and it was one of the best weeks. It was very interesting. The very first speaker uh, was Michael. Oh goodness, I forgot his name right now. I'm so sorry, but he wrote a book about collards um, Michael Twitty, and he was very good at talking about the history and the cultural significance of collards. It was really cool. So interested in that, check out the YouTube Collard Week. Okay, cauliflower, um, we are looking for overwintering types. Um, we found all year round, Fredor, Medallion, Picasso and, Picasso, and Prestige were the ones that did the best for us in our trial. Um, and those were transplanted in late July. Also purple spotted broccoli. This is one that um, if you haven't grown, it's really fun to grow. This is something that's you know relatively new in the marketplace as far as grocery stores. We've been seeing it in farmer's markets for quite some time. Um, so the ones that did the best for us in this trial, which a lot of them we. Um, well, a lot of them did overwinter and then Rudolph was a fall harvest for us, but Burgundy, Mendocino, Red Fire, and Rudolph being the fall harvested one. And these are transplanted in late July. Um, one other thing I want to talk to you about is I know, you know, you guys are all watching your gardeners, so you're probably all buying seed and growing everything from seed. Um, and one of the things I've really been excited about is to be able to extend this information to, you know, everyone to say, not just farmers, because I'm usually working the most closely with farmers and I get to tell them about the impacts and the results of our projects. But then with gardeners, I oftentimes tell them like, this is the tomato that was really great. This is the radicchio, things that you normally would um, seed and then transplant. And they might not be as adventurous as all of you that are tuning in today. So um, I partnered up with Log House Plants, which is a big wholesale nursery down in Cottage Grove. And you might've noticed if you, when you go to the, this is a picture from Portland Nursery. When you go into Portland Nursery, you're going to New Seasons or, you know, grocery stores and um, plant shops in Oregon and Washington buy a lot of, a lot of them buy starts from um, log house plants. And so this is a curated collection of plants, a lot of which are those that have done well in our trials. So the ones that we just started with for our spring, you know, um, seeded were um, separated two different categories uh, that the owner wanted me of log house plants asked me to do it this way. So suitcase seeds, meaning ones that were seed that was brought back from travels uh, and connections also with folks in other parts of the world that have sent seed to then give that seed to small regional seed companies here like adaptive seeds and uprising seeds and wild garden seed to then um, propagate the seed and grow it here. So they actually trial it, see if it does really well. If it does, then they start producing it and pick it up and then it will be available as seed from them. Like Pinky Tomato uh, was something that was brought back from Japan by someone that I sent uh, seed with to do a seed exchange. And you can buy that seed from Uprising Seeds, but if you don't like to grow your tomato transplants, then you could just buy transplants if you can find them at one of these um, nurseries that carries it, um, then you still get to grow the thing and have it 
the plant without having to start it from seed from your, by yourself. And then also the chef favorites are the ones that have done really well in our trials, but then also have like really stood out um, as ones that tasted really um, fantastic. So again, I put the, I, caught, I screenshotted this from a Word document. I didn't even notice that it had the red squiggles under it, but uh, you get the picture. So these are available right now. The winter ones will come out in about a month so that people can transplant and it will have all of the radicchio um, starts from the Gusto Italiano project, plus a lot of other um, varieties that you saw here um, in this presentation from our Eat Winter Vegetables project. And as I told you before, um, I wanted, I'm very excited to say that we will have the Sagrado Radicchio this year, at least unless something unforeseen happens, it will happen in Portland, Oregon at the Red. Um, so if you are in Portland or you're even close by at all, please drive and come to it. I think it will be quite worth it. Um, Sunday, October 24th is when we're planning on having that event. And to keep up with uh, all the information, like I told you in uh, upcoming projects and also upcoming events, um, the best thing to do really is Instagram. That's where the most up-to-date information is. Um, there's the Culinary Breeding Network, Instagram. And then we also have, um, and I post a lot about Radicchio, but there's also one that's all specific to Radicchio called Chicory Week. And then the websites, I've mentioned most of these, the Culinary Breeding Network, Eat Winter Squash, Eat Winter Vegetables, Eat Radicchio is another one that's specific to Radicchio and then the YouTube channel. And you can probably just Google YouTube and Culinary Breeding Network and it would come up. I think those are the best ways to, uh, to keep up with what's happening and find more information about winter vegetables and other vegetables. Thank you so much for having me. That's what I prepared and I want to take any questions that you guys have now. Great. Thank you very much, Elaine. So yeah. I have a few questions. And so I want to give a shout out to all the Facebook people, everyone who's um, watching it streamed on Facebook right now. So one of the questions that was from Facebook was, um, is there any soil prep that I need to do before planting? Good question. Well, um, <laughs> I mean, I don't think that it's going to be really that much different than when you are planting in the springtime. So that we have not in our trials done anything special, uh, you know, different, but we do do cover cropping in the wintertime on fallow land and we do side dress. So we, um, that's one thing that we find that we're doing uh, possibly more with winter vegetables than um, summer vegetables. Okay, great. Um, and then there's a couple other questions that were related to that. And I think you kind of addressed this a little bit about, do you recommend by starts or from seed? And then there's another one about the ideal planting time. Yeah, okay. So, um, you know, I think it's great when people can grow for, you know, um, if you can seed things, it's, it's the best. And it's easier to do this, to seed things for the winter vegetables, because we don't have to mess around like we do with tomatoes and peppers where you have to set, I mean, I'm guilty of this myself where I like, I need to set up my basement. I don't have a greenhouse. So I need to set my basement. I got to get the lights. I have to get the mat out. I have to get everything set up because you need to keep them very warm um, and under lights. Well, we can just actually just seed them all of these things directly into little six packs. You know, if you go get your, you know, a nice good like, uh, organic um, potting soil specifically for seeding, uh, I do mix it up with a, just a, like a 444 fertilizer or something, an equal fertilizer, um, and then put it into your cells. Um, you can just use the six packs if you want. If you have like the more commercial trays, you can use a little bit smaller than that. Um, and then you can seed them and then you can just leave them outside. So it's not as much work as it is for, you know, like I said, those things that we're really pushing the season here where we can't wait until it's warm enough to seed tomatoes outside. We have to seed them earlier inside. Um, so if you want to start, like, if you want to like try that out, I say the, the winter vegetables are a great thing to, to try out if you want to do seeds. Um, but then if you want kind of no fail, you know, mostly <laughs> is uh, just buying six packs of this and then, you know, of like whatever radicchio or Brussels sprouts and then just planting them in your yard. But um, I think if someone is tuning in today, they're the adventurous 
vegetable person and maybe just to start with try some seeds. What was the second question? So the second part was about um, when do you plant winter vegetables? And of course, that's going to be really variable. Yeah, it's variable. It's the one. So when I was showing you this, and this is recorded, so you could go back and look at this too. When I say the transplant, I give you the kind of the date, like I say, mid or early or late of a certain month. Um, those are transplanting. Um, so go four weeks before, and that's when we seeded it. So it's, and some are a little more flexible than others. Like I said, I'm like looking at radicchio right now. Radicchio, you could, you could probably seed in a time between early June to you know, the second week in July. Um, there's, um, you know, we, I think we said we, we transplanted our winter squash um, in big, at the beginning of June, um, but you could push that out. Like some people are still, you know, transplanting winter squash right now. Um, and, it's, and, and it's fine. This is commercial growers. Um, I think that there's a lot of resources out there. You know, I honestly use the Gardening on the West Side of the Cascades by Steve Solomon quite a bit for planting dates. Um, so even though this is what we did here, we kind of just follow what the, our farmers are doing. So sometimes that can be earlier than what gardeners are doing. But I think there's a lot of great resources out there um, from your, gar your local gardening shop. And like I said, um, I really do like that Steve Solomon book. Great, Lane. And I also wanted to um, mention that P&W 540, mm -hmm. which is um, the winter the winter vegetable gardening publication, is currently being revised, and it should hopefully be coming out as under peer review right now. And Lane is a co-author on that, along with myself. So that will be a really good resource for home gardeners and for commercial gardeners when that comes out. Um, the other Facebook comment was about um, there's a lot of excitement about radicchio and your interest, their interest in which varieties you recommend. And I think you've probably, I think you mentioned that in your presentation, correct? And then it's also perhaps in the eatradicchio.com. Mm -hmm. um, would that be a good place to look for? Yes. I, one thing I didn't mention that people really, really love these pink ones, right? There's two of them up here, the one in the center and the one on the bottom right hand side. They love these pink ones and I do too, but just know that they are, they are really long season ones. So um, it takes the cold weather to turn them pink. And I, another thing I didn't mention is with radicchio as a gardener, you often think that you're failing because you're like, these things aren't heading up. These things aren't turning pink. These things are completely rotten and disgusting. <laughs> well, they, they, that is actually like, those are just things that happen. Um, it takes a long time for the pink to turn pink. So you're not failing because you are, didn't get the wrong plant or the wrong seed because you know it's still green. It's because it hasn't yet turned pink. And then a lot of times they will be looser heads and then they will actually start to form denser heads further on in the season. And then one thing that when Heidi was growing these, um, she hadn't grown any any um, radicchio trials until a couple of years ago. And she said, oh, Lane, I think these are all rotten. And, you know, I think, so they got a disease, they don't look good. And I went out there and I was like, oh yeah, cause I hadn't grown radicchio trials before, but I had it'd been a while and I'd forgotten. I was like, oh yeah, it completely like at, if you're overwintering them, all the outer leaves like die and they become really slimy and gross. And you think, oh, <laughs> like this is bad, you know, but then actually you just kind of, pull those back, um, you know, just get in there and just slough off all that gross rotting outer leaves. And then there's these little gems inside, just these beautiful little purple gems. So um, that is all to be expected. One other thing I didn't mention about radicchio is it doesn't have very many insect or disease problems or anything like that. But if you do have uh, voles um, or shrews, like they really love to eat radicchio root. It's really sweet and it's very big. And so they come in underground and a lot of times you don't see that there's any damage. And all of a sudden you notice that you've got like this wilted head and you don't understand what's going on. And you can, if you pull it out and look at it, a lot of times it will have a hollow stem, perfectly hollow stem inside because the rodents have been eating them. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, Next question is, do you have any herbs that you can recommend that won't die in the winter? Oh, I act, so, okay, so if you go to Wild Garden Seed, um, um, Frank Morton, who owns that company with his wife, Karen, did a breeding project with parsley. 
And he has some really fantastic parsley offerings. Like one is called um, Hungarian land race. Another one is called Macedonian something or other. But he took a lot of um, varieties like accessions and got seed from the Grin database and grew them out one year specifically to try to find ones that didn't bolt and also overwintered. So there are some really fantastic parsley um, out there, I know that. Okay, great, thanks, Lane. Mm -hmm. So the next question is about um, winter vegetables being prone to aphids and other insects. Is, is, I don't know if you have any recommendations regarding managing those. I know that there's a number of resources out there, like for example, mm -hmm. for cabbage aphid, but I don't know if you have any specific thoughts about um, aphids in winter vegetables. One thing that um, that some that a farmer up in the um, no, he's up in Squim does is he plants phacelia at this. I don't know what I, I can't tell you. You have to look this up. If you Google phacelia and brassicas and aphids, I think that you can find information about the timing specifically because one has to be planted before the other so that they're actually um, working at the right times together, but that deters a lot of um, aphids from brassicas. And I've heard quite a bit that that does well. Um, otherwise, I know there's like insecticidal soaps that you can use, um, but most of the time I hear the farmers talking about the, the phacelia. Great, thank you, Lane. Mm -hmm. Can you please repeat the variety of varieties of cauliflower that you liked. Oh yeah, let's go back to it. Do you mind? <laughs> I can remember. There we go. All year round, Fedor, Medallion, Picasso, and Prestige. Great. I'm sorry I don't have the, um, the in this, you have to Google all year round. I, I kind of feel like I remember it being from West Coast Seed, but for some reason we didn't, I didn't have this information. Okay, great. Um, here's a good question. Does the purple sprouting broccoli, or the purple broccoli taste the same as the green broccoli? You know, I feel like it's a little bit sharper. I feel like it's like a little bit less sweet and a little sharper. Um, but at the same time, I think it's absolutely delicious. Great. So speaking of, I guess, sharpness or um, flavoring, I have the question of how many, why are so many winter vegetables bitter in flavor? That's a good question. Hmm. I don't know because the cold makes them much sweeter, right? Um, but there's gotta be some, some reason that they're all more bitter. I don't know what it is though. <laughs> I don't know either. I thought it was a very interesting question though. <laughs> I can't believe anyone's ever asked me that before because it is like very earthy, very bitter, you know. Um, but at the same time, all those things, if grown in the summertime, are far more bitter. You know, like I interpret them as sweet. I think of them as sweet because when you think about kale, it's like it becomes more sweet. But it, there is a bitterness to kale, right? But it's like it's less bitter in the winter than it is in the summer. Great. So I have a couple of questions about like covering um, and um, I guess maybe growing the vegetables during winter. Do you need to cover the vegetables during winter weather? Do I need a hoop house for overwintered veggies? So, I mean, obviously a lot is going to have to do with where they live, but if you want to yeah. comment on that quickly. I mean, our, our trials that we did, we don't use any protection at all. So, I mean, you can do that. You can use remade and make it warmer. You can put it in a hoop for sure. Those things are gonna make it far more, um, you know, successful if you're worried, because you just don't know what's gonna happen in the winter. It could be a mild winter. It could be a harsh winter. Um, and it, yeah, like you said, it depends on where you are. But to let you know, like these weren't, these, this is what we found in Canby, Oregon, two years of growing them and without any kind of protection at all. Okay, perfect. Um, and so it said, so that um, I guess on that note, when you're recommending varieties, what zone are they, what zones are they good for? I'm not sure of how far they would translate, honestly, because it's just in our area that we're growing them, you know? 
Sure. And I think, you know, potentially looking in seed catalogs and that sort yeah, of just... tell you what the USDA hardiness zone they are. And it may depend on yeah. what you're looking at. Maybe do that. That's a great suggestion. Like if it's like, if you're like saying, you know, I'd say that Picasso works well, then take a look at it and see if you think it would do well in your area, like in the seed catalog. Okay. Good. So I think we're about wrapping up. We still have a number of questions. So um, if you're, you know, on, if you didn't get your question answered, you're welcome to um, contact your local extension office and, you know, a uh, master gardener, or other um, perhaps extension agent would, can help you with your question. Um, but I do want to thank all of you for coming today. I really want to thank Lane for her time. Um, I do want to mention again that you'll be receiving an evaluation of the presentation via email along with the some of the resources that Lane mentioned in her presentation. So look out for that and please um, answer, the, answer the survey if you don't mind. Um, if you're an Oregon Master Gardener volunteer, you can receive um, continuing education for watching today's session. So track and submit your time through the guidance of your county coordinator. And our next webinar in this series will be Firewise Landscaping on July 13th. So the whole schedule for the Growing, Oregon's Le Growing Oregon Gardeners Level Up series is on our website, and we hope to see you at a future session. So in the meantime, happy gardening, and thank you again to Lane and all of you for attending.